Welcome to our Shepherd's Bible Study. It's so great that you could all join us again. <coughs> Before we get started, it's been a couple weeks now, <coughs> excuse me, since we've been able to um, put forth the lecture. I just want to let you all a little bit of insight without revealing too much. Uh, Pastor Donna and myself, of course Pastor Donna is, is my wife as well, uh, <coughs> have been going through medical issues and to the point where uh, uh, a lot of pain and suffering has been involved with, with this uh, particular situation with her a certain situation, with me a different situation, but it appears that both of us had, had gone through this. Uh, not that either one of us is completely well at this point, but uh, well enough. Um, and I thank God for that. So I do apologize for all those who expected a lecture every week. Uh, but I'll reiterate, and I've, I've said this before, that um, as we age, the age that uh, we are at this point, uh, we just don't know from week to week uh, whether or not we're going to have uh, certain um, illnesses or sicknesses uh, that will interfere with us in doing the lecture. So keep us in your prayers. Uh, we appreciate that as well as we'll keep praying for you all. Now today's lecture we're getting back into uh, 1 Corinthians today with chapter 11 and uh, I was uh, told to uh, caption this as why many are sick and weak among you. Not that this is a catch-all, that this is a catch-all for everything, but um, it will explain why certain things are happening to a lot of people today. So with that being said, um, please join me in prayer this day. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity of this day. We thank you for the blessings that you have bestowed upon each and every one of us. Father, our cups truly do runneth over, always, <coughs> in sickness and in health, because you were always there. You were always there with us. And all you require is just one thing, is our love, our commitment to you, that we stay focused, and to do what you have proclaimed for us to do through thy word and by thy word, through thy commandments, through the, thy ordinances, to which we continuously learn today. We thank you for all these unspoken prayers that have come before you. You know every heart, every need, every wish, every dream, every concern. And we thank you for not only hearing these prayers, but we thank you for answering them always in perfect season. Also before you, Father, uh, we bring and pray for Barbara, Michael, Donna, Braden, and you know this unnamed girl's name who is also uh, uh, getting ready to bear a child. We pray for her safety and, and a, um, a good childbirth. And we pray for all those who are sick and weak among us. And there are many. And as we'll learn today, there are many that are going through this needlessly because of what they have chosen to do in life, which we, and, and I thank you for your teachings of this today. And we pray for all those who are dealing with hopelessness. They're in a position, and that's the exact word to use, is hopelessness. They feel deep in their hearts, in their minds, that there's no hope for them. Well, we pray for them, Father, that they will learn if not today, very soon, that they will learn that there is no such thing with you as hopelessness, just weakness and faith. And we pray, dear Lord, that their faith will grow stronger this day. 
And we pray always, Father, for all those who have come and gone from our chapel, wherever they are, where whatever they are doing, we pray for their safety and speedy return home to the sheepfold. And we pray for Israel and our nation, for thy kingdom to come, that it will be thy will that will be done on this earth as it is in heaven, to which we say, Come, Lord, come. And we pray for those first responders. Every day they're on the front lines helping your children. We pray for their safety as well, as well as our military who are in arms way, who, who are still about to go into arms way. We pray for their speedy return home safely. And as always, Father, we pray for the lost, those that do not have an opportunity this day to receive thy truth. Now, Father, I pray that you open up our eyes that we may see our ears that we may hear thy words as it is written, as it will be you that speaks to us through thy divine word. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Okay, getting back into our Father's word, we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 with wisdom from our Heavenly Father. Now Paul starts off, he says, be ye followers of me. Now, if you stop there, it sounds like Paul is blowing his own horn here. Hey, follow me. Fo follow my name. That's not what Paul is saying at all. Listen. Be ye followers of me, even as I am, I also am of Christ. Now, is Paul calling himself Christ? Of course not. Well, Paul is saying, I need you to follow me as I follow Christ. In other words, don't follow uh, what, it, what I'm doing. Don't put your faith in me. Put your faith in Christ as I put my faith in Christ. And he's going to elaborate here about man and woman. And you can overread this, or better said, read over this in the wrong way, in a, in a milk way. And yes, you can receive information out of it, but you're not going to receive the fullness of the third uh, understanding which we're going to get into today. Verse 2 says, Now I praise you. Now remember he's, he, who he's writing this to. He's writing this to the elect that are in Corinth. He says, I praise you, brethren, brothers and sisters, that ye remember me in all things. Not that they remember Paul, but they remember the teachings of Paul, that they remember the teachings that Paul has brought forward to the Corinthians and others, and keep the ordinances. What does that mean? Keep the laws of God. It says ordinances, but it's not just talking about ordinances. It's talking about the um, basically the laws of God or the laws of Moses, as it was called back then. But also the ordinances, meaning the laws that Christ had brought forward of the interpretations thereof, of certain things that man was getting wrong in the law. So Paul's saying, look, remember those things that I have taught you as I delivered them to you. Verse 3. But I would have you know, I want you to know this, that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is the man and the head of Christ is God now this isn't this isn't saying that the man is to rule over the woman uh, it is to say Christ is to rule over man but breaking this down what Paul is bringing forth here there's an uh, an order of things, <coughs> excuse me, that God has brought forward to us. Excuse me. There's an order of things. Now, coming out the gate, when, when, when Paul says, look, uh, men, I want you to follow Christ, and women, I want you to follow the man, and, and, um, and the head of Christ is God. Now, Paul is not saying that all women must be subservient to all men. What this is, is this is an order that God has brought forward 
for those that are, now hear this, those that are following and obedient to God. In other words, they're living a godly manner, in a godly way. And uh, thank you. And, um, and if you're in a household and you are living in a godly way, this is the order of things. Now, now, why even come up with an order of things? Because you can't have two chiefs. What does that mean? A lot of people want to say, well, we're equal, and you are, as husband and wife. However, there are certain times in life that you're going to have a disagreement about something, whether it be financial or, or, or health-wise or whatever the case may be. So there needs to be, if you have a disagreement, and you go to God, of course, on that disagreement, that our Father is going to maybe not necessarily give you both the information that you need to continue. He may just give the man, or he may just give the woman. But the point is, somebody's got to make a decision. And this is the order of things that God originally has put in place. Now, that is what this world and this society today is completely going against. It doesn't want that structure of a marriage in the way God put it together. They want a structure of a marriage the way they put it together. And I understand, I understand where they're coming from. I, I hear their voices, but this is what our Father has put together, and there's a reason for that. There's a reason for it. But again, the key factor here is if everyone is walking in a godly manner. Perfect example. Let's say you have a husband and wife, and the husband has fallen off of the way of God, but the woman has not. Well, guess who's going to have more wisdom than the male at that point? Say. So you, as long as you're following God, you will be making the right decision and you will be do, doing things in an orderly fashion. And here's the thing. If, if you are walking with God and following his word, this is what you want in your household. You won't have the confusion and the division. and The, the, the two will become one and in most cases when they don't let the flesh override the spirit they will agree to whatever the whatever the Lord wants basically in their lives at that point true but there are times I believe that even when you're walking with God uh, a situation may come up in a marriage that you have a disagreement about well, you can still that. you can still be walking with God but for some unknown reason, at that point, you can't come to the meetings of the mind. Well, we've had that in our in our yes, relationship have. where we've had a discussion about something, and you would say to me, "Would well, you mean to tell me that God's telling you one thing and me another?" Exactly. And what it came down to at that point was one of us, whether it was you or I, because we've both been there, was using more fleshly eyes to look at the situation right. than godly eyes. That's right. So. And and it's it's been proven over and over in our Father's Word. When you take your eyes off the ball, and the ball being God, Christ, you're not going to make the right decision. Mm -hmm. you know. So, being a help mate means if one falters, the other one picks it up. Mm -hmm. You know. So this isn't this isn't being etched in stone where the woman's got to follow exactly. the man. You know, exactly. that's that's what a lot of men and some preachers will teach. They'll even say, well, that's why a woman can't teach. Well, that they don't understand the Bible. You know. All right, verse 4. Now I want to read verse 4 through 6. Now we're getting into, really at this point, uh, you can read this at a milk level, but I'm, I want to bring forth the third level of understanding. Better said our Father wants that third level of understanding what this represents to come out. Listen to verse 4 through 6. Every man praying or prophesying, teaching, having his head covered 
dishonoreth his head. Um, now this, going back to that period of time, is what the heathen did. Um, verse 5, But every woman that prayeth, or prophesieth, oh, women can prophesy, that's what our Father says, women can teach as well, if they've been given the gift of teaching from our Father. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. For that is even all one as if she were shaven or had all her hair shaven. And that was a sign of, back then, of disgrace, uh, servitude. Verse 6. For if the woman be not covered... Let her also be shorn. Take off all her hair. But, if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. Now you can read this on a milk level and say, well, a woman's got to put a, a, a scarf or something over her head and a, and a man doesn't do this. has nothing to do with any of that. With the third level of understanding, this goes down and all the way back to Genesis chapter 6 about the fallen angels. Going back, I'm going to read very quickly Genesis what is it, chapter 6, verse 1, I believe. Let me look at it. And it came to pass when man, being Adam, flesh man, began to multiply in the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God, the sons of God is uh, written in the manuscripts as angelic beings here. That the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair. And they took them wives of all which they chose. What do you mean angels took wives? These were fallen angels, beloved. And that's, exa that's why Noah's flood came. We've studied this before, but to recap very quickly that that these uh, um, angelic beings came to earth which they were not supposed to do and they had sexual relations with flesh women in the Philium? yes were born and Geber giants uh, misfits as they were called verse 3 and the Lord said my spirit shall not always strive with man for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be in a hundred and twenty years. And verse 4 says, There were giants in the earth in those days. That came from the relations that the angels had with the women. And also after that, when the sons of God came in under the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. And it goes on to talk about the wickedness of man at that point. And at that point, God was going to eliminate everybody off the face of the earth. Until he saw Moses and how Moses stayed true with God. And those that were with Moses and in his family. So this is what this is talking about in chapter 11 verses 4 through 6. For a woman to be covered, that means to be covered, not with a handkerchief over their head, but to be covered by Christ. That way, the sons of God cannot come and interfere in a woman's life today. Or Satan cannot come in and interfere in a woman's life to, today, unless she gives him authority to do so. You say, well, why in the world would anybody give Satan authority to come in? Sometimes unawares. Sometimes unawares. That's why we study our Father's Word. That, that, that Satan comes in so unaware, you don't even know he's there until you're trapped in his trap. He's very conniving, very deceitful. Well, if you're not aware, it could be through things that you watch, things that you hear, people that you hang out with, even the things you think. Perfect example, uh, the other day, um, I don't know if it was yesterday or when it was, it was recently, uh, I was on the computer in the office and Donna was out here scrolling through the uh, television and there was an old, old program that came on 
that she scrolled on. Movie. Uh, a movie. And it was called The Thirteen Ghosts. Now, back in the day when I was a kid, I saw this movie. As a matter of fact, I really enjoyed that movie as a young per I wasn't even an adult at that. I was a kid. <coughs> I had to have those 3D glasses on and all that. <coughs> but I've learned over the years things that enter these peepers, things that enter these eyes, if it's not holy, Satan can use that avenue to come in and to interfere in your life. And he'll use movies or like whatever else you talked about to do just that. Come in unawares. You're, you're just trying to be entertained. Well, you're going to get entertained, all right, but you're going to get entertained by the wrong spirit. So, uh, well, as a matter of fact, uh, I told her it was mm -hmm. on. And then I went in the office. Mm -hmm. Well, she started not watching it really, but hesitating on the 13 ghosts as it's continued. And I remember yelling from the office, don't watch that, you know, mm -hmm. to which at that time, oh yeah, this is something that, that can cause me difficulties. And she turned it, as well as we should. There's a big difference between watching 13 ghosts and Godzilla. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. But, um, mm -hmm. and we like some of this fantasy stuff, and we know it's fantasy. And, and some people say, well, that's just a movie. It's not real. Yes, it's a movie and it's not real. But let me tell you something. Satan will use any avenue that he can to enter into your life. And if you're mesmerized by something that's unholy, and that's what that spiritual realm is. Now, I don't mean holy spiritual. I mean evil spirits. Um, and certain things can happen. Not necessarily by and from that movie, it just opens up a door. And all Satan needs is a little crevice in a door You're letting your to guard. come in to, to cause problems, to cause disruption, to cause all kinds of negative behavior. You let your guard down. Yes. You put a so in your spiritual armor. That's why we got to be careful what we, what we bring into these eyes. You know. Verse 7, For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God. What, do you, what does a man cover his head with? Christ. What does a woman cover her head with? Christ. That's all this is talking about. But the woman is the glory of the man. Not, not that the woman gets glory from the man. The man, the structure of the family paradigm is where the man is supposed to be the, the head of the household in a godly manner. And likewise, the woman would help the man to achieve that goal. Not that it says here the woman is the glory. Oh, the woman, she's not going to have any glory if she doesn't follow her man. That's not what this is talking about. But this, you see, this is the difficulty men and some preachers try to burden a woman with. You know, or to puff a man up with. Why in the world would you want to do that if it goes completely against what God wants? Does, and this was causing difficulties with people. What? Doesn't it mean that if the woman is following Christ and helping her husband to follow Christ, that they both benefit, they're both blessed. And Absolutely. they realize that in each of them, they're a blessing to the other. Absolutely. That's the way it's supposed to work. You know. Verse 8, for the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. And all this means is that in the beginning, what had happened in the Garden of Eden, that the helix curve, or the curve, it's called um, a rib in the Bible, in the English translation, but it's not a rib. A rib was not removed from a man and given to a woman to make a woman. How do we know this? Because, guess what, if you count, if you know the anatomy, a man has just as many ribs as a woman has. What this is talking about is really DNA. When, when Adam was first created by God, he had both features in him. He had a woman feature and a male feature, even though he was called man. And then when God put Adam to sleep, he removed that curve. It's called the rib in the English 
uh, translation, but it was the helix curve. He removed the fa feminine part of that entity and created woman. That's all it means. And the two become one. Verse 9. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. Why was the woman created for the man, as it is written? As a help mate. To be there, to help. Let me tell you something. Recently, and I know I, I started the lecture with this, um, but Donna's been basically off her feet for a while. And I had to do certain things that uh, I always relied on Donna to do. And um, I found out, which, which I knew beforehand, but it's not easy. It's not easy because a woman, in my opinion, at least in this household, she's constantly doing something. If it's not for me, it's for her. If it's not for me and her, it's for Teddy or for somebody else. She's always there trying to do good. And she does. She does a very good job at it. Well, we, we discussed that it was, it's like I don't do big things. Like I don't go to work and I don't bring home money, but I do a Let lot of things. Let me tell you something. I would rather, <laughs> I would rather, I used to think, oh, I, I wouldn't mind staying at home and, and let her go to work. Uh-uh. Let me tell you something. <laughs> to, to stay at home and to, to do the work that she does in the home, to keep it not only running but clean and, and, and practical and everything, it's a hard job. And you know what? It doesn't stop. At, like me, at the end of the day, I come home and put my feet up uh, and where's my supper kind of thing. I, it's not that. I don't act that way. Well, sometimes I do <laughs> when I'm hungry. But um, my day's over, right? Well, her day isn't over. And I see this, uh, and I, I, I keep this in my mind, at women at work that, that I work with. You know, they work all day and doing their jobs, but when they go home, I realize they're not going home putting their feet up. They're going home and cook, a lot of times cooking meals and taking care of the kids and putting them to bed and doing laundry and, and yada, yada, yada. Now, some men will pick it up and, and help them with all those things, <coughs> and God bless them for doing it. I'm just saying we're supposed to be their helpmate for each other. And if one is down, the other one steps up. That's the way it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. The other one steps up to try to help maintain what the status quo is in the family household. Verse 10, For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Now that's going back to Genesis um, um Chapter 6, where basically those angels came in and they had relations with a woman. You say, well, wait a minute now. That happened back then. Why is this saying now in the New Testament about a, uh, her head, be, uh, power on her head because of the angels? What's the power on her head? Christ. Mm -hmm. She needs to have Christ over her head. For what purpose? Because of those fallen angels. You say, well, those fallen angels aren't here right now. No, but guess what? As the word declares, they are going to return. And they're going to try and do the same exact thing. As a matter of fact, they are going to do the same exact thing as they did back then. Except, by the period of time, there will be no children born to the women because we're only on a five-month period at that time. So uh, there will be no babies born to these sons of God but they when they return. But they still influence the women. But they still will influence the women, but they will also influence the man as well. Isn't that kind of happening now? Not with, not with the fallen angels. Mm -hmm. what's, what's happening now is because of the spirit of, of the Antichrist mm -hmm. and people following that spirit thinking that they're following Jesus, but they're not at all. Well, I'm also talking about those that are doing the satanic rituals and stuff. Well, of course that. You know, you've, you, you've got the, the, the Wiccan the and yeah. the spirit of the Antichrist and all that. Yes, you have people doing that today. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm seeing that more and more. 
on um, uh, movies and on um, music. entertainment, music, uh, music entertainment. Uh, different things, and um, just what people, how people are behaving, and they're showing more about sa satanic ideas and thoughts than they are of God. And we see a decline today, a big decline today, of how many people actually believe in God, let alone Jesus. You know, it's getting worse and worse and worse. So, and the Word has told us over and over and over, you forsake me, I will forsake you. In other words, if you don't, if you don't want me, what God is saying, I'm not going to force myself on you. It's not that he's going to leave you. He, he, he says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. But he also said that you forsake me, I will forsake you. In other words, if you choose to not accept me and walk in my ways, I'm going to allow you to walk in the ways of the world, which is, who's the head of the world right now? Death. Huh? Death. <laughs> Satan. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. He's called the prince of the air. That's this flesh age. And he's, his spirit is all around us. That's why we have so much difficulties in this world today for those that are following in that worldly manner. Nevertheless, verse 11 says, Neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. And we know the two become one in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. Yes. I know this is kind of out of, con not out of context, but out of order here. I... One of the teachings that we follow on YouTube, preachers, had brought up the fact that as far as Adam and Eve go, that, you know, okay, Eve was made from Adam's rib and all this, but as far as the sin entering in, that, yes, Eve ate, as the Bible put, of the fruit of the tree of good and evil, put it that way. Um, she allowed Satan in, but Adam knew God had told Adam specifically not to do that. And Adam... Told never them told, both. No, he told Adam. Adam never told Eve. Because Eve was created after God told Adam about not to eat from the tree. You mean to tell me you're saying that Adam never told Eve not to touch that tree? I don't think so. I don't believe that well, at that's all. What that, that's what that one preacher said. I that, don't believe that at all. I'll have to research it um, and see. Because if... You cannot be found guilty mm. if you... Have not been given a law. Ignorance. You can't. You can't be found guilty of sin mm -hmm. if you have not been told what sin but is. It says that sin entered through the man. Sin did enter through the man, but it entered through the woman as well. Mm -hmm. They, not one was left behind in the garden. They both were kicked out. I understand. Woman was given the trial of childbirth, childbearing. Man had to work the ground from the sweat of his brow. Did it not say with Adam, we're getting off the context here, but did it not say where Adam said, the woman told yeah, me to he, eat? He blamed her. Well, he did blame her. Yeah, but did, she, did he tell her not to eat of it? That's the, we need to reset. Is it written that he told her no. not to? No, it's not written. But it's one of those things like, let me, let me put it to you a different way. Can you be found guilty of sin if you don't know what sin is? No. Okay. Was Eve found guilty by God? Well, yeah. She was kicked out of the garden. Why was she kicked out of the garden? Because she disobeyed. Yeah. Okay. See? So the, free, the teacher was not correct. I would that. imagine. Yeah. I, I can't prove that Adam told Eve. Mm -hmm. But... Um, the course of events does say Common that. sense yeah. and the way God works. God's not going to... Uh, find you guilty of sin if you don't know what sin is. Yeah. Okay. No. She would be held unaccountable, mm -hmm. and she was held accountable. So, yes, in fact, she did know. Okay. How she found out, it's not written. But I do know this, just by godly wisdom, God's not going to blame her for sin if she didn't know what that sin was. Yeah. Okay. Um, verse 11. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. I read that. Verse 12. For 
as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman. Two become one. You're together. You're, you're in it together. But all things of God, all things come from, all good things come from God. All good things should be glorified to God. Verse 13, judge in yourselves. Is it calmly or proper that a woman pray unto God uncovered? Is it proper for a woman to pray unto God without Jesus in her life? Mm. Say, Jesus is our intercessor. Now, I know what some of you are going to say. Well, wait a minute now. The apostles asked Jesus, well, teach us to pray. Well, Jesus didn't say, this is the way you pray. Our dear Lord Jesus Christ, forgive us of our sins. Now it says, our Father who art in heaven. See, Jesus was trying to explain, he, yes, he is God. Emmanuel, God with us. But he came in the flesh and God is so holy that we cannot visually see his presence. But God needed to make his presence known to one-on-one -on -one talk with people. That's why we have the Bible, to bring this forth. Now, could, have, could God have done it all through, through prophets and, and, and scribes and all? Yes, he could have. But he came as our example. To show us. Well, we had to see. We had to visualize that example. We had to visualize. It's one thing telling someone about a miracle. Like uh, bringing the uh, death back to life. It's one thing reading that. But it's a, quite another thing visualizing and being there and seeing it. And that's, and Christ came. And he had to come to defeat death. That was the whole purpose, so that we could, all those that believe on him should have everlasting life. So, it's, it's asking, judging yourself, is it, is it proper that a woman pray unto God uncovered? No. Well, listen, doth not even, verse 14, even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him. This is being in... Greek. Now listen, verse 15. Now, now why would it say shame unto him? If you don't have Christ over you, it would be shameful for you. Well, also too, you have to understand, in Corinth they were Greek, and Greek men all had short hair. To have long hair was an embarrassment mm -hmm. to them. I'm saying the, the, the baby level. Did Paul have level. short hair? No. Yeah, he did. Oh, did he? As a matter of fact, there was a point Paul shaved his head. Oh. Remember, he was a Nazarene, Nazarite. Right, right, right. Nazarite, and, yeah. and, and part of that order, when you finish your training, you grow your hair. You let your hair grow long, 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 until you're done training, then you shave your head. Right. Then you go out in the highways and byways, and you start ministering. That was their order of things. But this has nothing to do with hair, see? Because, because the fact of the matter, this is the covering... What our Father wants us to get out of this is the covering that we have over our heads. Not that it has anything to do with hair. If it had anything to do with hair, I would be in trouble. <laughs> so. But I'm saying he was trying to explain to them in the way they understood. In the way they understood at the time. Mm -hmm. But again, when, when man gets a hold of something and they hear something, such as spiritual matters coming from Paul, coming from God, through Paul and in the name of Jesus Christ they will take it and run with it mm -hmm. just like what we've covered up to this point so far is that man will say well no, a woman has to be subservient you don't believe me read it for yourself well see they're taking it out of context they're not allowing the Spirit of God to unveil to them of what this is in uh, meaning and some people are going to say, well, why doesn't he just talk more plain? Because this isn't for everybody. You say, well, wait a minute, the Word of God isn't for everybody? No, it's not. The deeper meaning. You say, well, wait a minute, no, the Word. Mm. 
You say, why is the word of God for It's available to everybody, but it's not written so everybody can fully understand. That's why Christ taught in parables. And those parables were only understood, sometimes only by Christ revealing what it meant, but other times it was revealed to people that, that heard it for the first time and they were just overwhelmed and, and just fell in love with the word, with, with Christ, and they wanted to follow him wherever he went. And they weren't there just for a fish sandwich. They wanted to hear more and more of his teachings. It has to do with the where the others wanted to put him to death. You it see the big difference? It has to do with the desire to They had they heard the same word, mm -hmm. but some accepted and some rejected. You know, that's why it's not for everybody. Some people just reject it coming out the gate. They had no faith whatsoever. And it's still the same thing. So are seeds. Verse fifteen. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. And, and, and that's how it was back then. And to, to cause a woman to be, especially when a, uh, a foreign land would come and take over, let's say, the Jews uh, because of their disobedience to God. You know what they did to a lot of the women that shaved their hair off? What they did with a lot of men, they'd shave their beards off because it was a sign of degradation, you know. Um, but again, this has nothing, even though it's talking about hair. You mean to tell me God is more, to God it's more important that you have a nice head of hair? No, we're not talking about hair. We're talking about your covering. And your covering needs to be Jesus Christ. You need to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. And to the best of your ability, walk in the commandments, walk in the ordinances of His Word. All ordinances means is, is laws. His laws, not man's laws, not traditions of men, but God's laws. But, 16 says, if any man seem to be contentious, not satisfied... Uh, argumentative. Argumentative. We have no such custom, neither the churches of God. In other words, if you don't want to follow this, we're not going to get in your face and tell you you're going to hell. You, you don't want to believe in this. You don't want to believe in Christ being your covering. We ain't got anything else to tell you. Because you're not gonna you're not gonna understand anything at that point. You say, well, that's that's kind of a a junky way of of looking. Aren't we supposed to be helping every? Yes, we're supposed to help everybody that we can that are willing to accept. At least take the time to listen. They may not agree, but they take the time to listen, and that goes into this this membrane up here called the brain. And they may not accept now, but it's there. It's there. It's, it, it, it's, it's you know, like Donna was saying the other day, we, we only use 10% of our brain. You know, it, there's a lot of storage going on in there. There's a lot of stuff in there that we may, may not even bring forward. But by the Lord's hand, someday it will come forward. And those seeds that you plant now that are not accepted, don't think that you failed or that you're a failure not getting through. No, you did what you're supposed to do, and some you just got to let it lie. Just let it lie and let it fester and let God do the watering with that, spiritually speaking. 17, now, in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not that ye come together not for the better, but for the worst. Uh, basically, Paul's getting ready to say here, you don't come together to build each other up. You're, not, you're, you're doing certain things incorrectly. Now listen, verse 18. Well, first of all, this is why he said this. When you come together in the church, I hear that be divisions or dissension among you. And I partly believe it. <laughs> Why would Paul say that? Because he knows human nature. And, and he was there. And he, he knows how they were. But listen. 
what's he talking about? Verse 19. For there must be also heresies or errors among you. You say, well, I thought they were God's elect. Yes, but some were still making mistakes. Listen. For there must be also heresies among you that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. And uh, we're, we're going to come to see here, he's really talking at this particular point about how they came together for Holy Communion. Mm -hmm. What some were doing and what some weren't doing. Listen, verse 20. When ye come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. In other words, you're not coming to Holy Communion to have Holy Communion. What some of you were coming to do was get your bellies full and get drunk with wine. And that's not what Holy Communion is supposed to be at all. Listen to verse 21 and 22. For in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper. In other words, before you have a Holy Communion, if you're hungry, eat some at your house. Then come for Holy Communion. And one is hungry and another is drunken. 22, what? Paul says. Have ye not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise ye the church of God? And shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. I'm not going to praise you for coming to have Holy Communion and eating all the bread and drinking all the wine and getting your belly's full and getting drunk on wine. And there's people out there that come that want Holy Communion, can't receive it because there's nothing left. See, this is just one thing that was taking place, not with everybody in Corinth, but in, the, in, in, in a big enough uh, assembly where they was a lot of them were doing this that was causing difficulties. It's a big thing. It's a holy sacrament. It's a. It's a. They weren't taking it as holy. That's what I'm saying. They're making a mockery of it. Twenty-three. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. What I what the Lord gave me, I give to you. That the Lord Jesus. The same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. He's reminding them now of what, why we have Holy Communion and what it means. That the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, 24, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take it, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. 25, after the same manner also he took the cup. When he had supped, that's this after supper. That was the uh, 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 Passover supper. After supper, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. That doesn't mean get drunk on it. It means every time you do this, you remember why you're doing it and what's the purpose behind it. Because of what the Lord Jesus Christ did for us, taking away our sins on the cross. And the blood and his body that he shed on that cross, that's what it represents. Not getting drunk. Not filling your bellies with, with uh, unleavened bread. 26, for as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show, you proclaim the Lord's death till he come. That's why you do it. And that's what it's to represent. Now why is all this so important? You're going to see in just a moment. 27, wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord, that means the uh, Holy Communion, unworthily that means in a in, in in an unworthy manner if you do this shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord you're going to be guilty in your own sins you say well, I'm taking Holy Communion how can I be uh, guilty of sin because you're doing it unworthily you're making doing a mockery you're making a 
thank you. You're making a mockery of it. You're, you're not there for the Lord. You're not there to remember what he did. You're there to get your belly full. Or there to get a, 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 what's buzz. a buzz. <laughs> on another terminology today. You're there to get drunk on wine. Verse 28 says, But let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. That's what you're supposed to do. 29. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself. Even though you're taking Holy Communion, you're sinning because you're doing it for self. In other words, you're doing it unworthily. You're there to get drunk and, and, and to, to eat the bread. Not discerning the Lord's body. You're not even thinking about what the Lord Jesus Christ. Now why is all this so important to get right? Well, listen to this next verse. This is why we came here and went through all of this. Verse 30. For this cause, because of some of you doing this, for this cause many are weak and sickly, among you and many sleep many die in their sins so wait a minute now they're Christian so yes. that doesn't mean weak and sickly illness it means weak and sickly in body as far as your spiritual health your spiritual and physical health because let's face it if spiritually speaking if you are sick that means what you are <coughs> going against God in one way or another. Okay, when one goes against God in one way or another, what happens to their flesh bodies? Is it thriving and and vibrant and 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 and, and just having great things happen to them in the world, or are they experiencing difficulties and 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 hardships and going through pain? sorrow, suffering. You know, now this is just one aspect. This doesn't cover everything that people do. But this is talking about one particular thing. The first thing we had is having the cover of Christ over you. And once you have the Christ over you, you part even though you have Christ over you, you participate in holy communion. That's what we are programmed and uh, taught to do for a particular reason, to remember what He did for us. We're commanded to do it. Huh? We're commanded to do it. We're so, following. Those that follow. But the point is, is that when you disobey God and you start doing things on your own, however you want to do it on your own, you're going to fail. And you're going to fail miserably. Maybe not all at first, but it's going to get worse and worse and worse. Just as you had to learn to climb the ladder, you're going to find out that, that once you disrespect God and you do things against Him, that ladder, instead of going up, you are going down to the point, and it's going to take time. And the thing is, it just depends on your situation and how far you get away from God. That that doesn't mean that everyone that is suffering with illness and sickness has disobeyed God or fallen away. No, from that's God. why I said this is a, one particular situation. Mm -hmm. We can't we can't lump we can't everything in. lump everything into this. We're talking about a certain situation where God's children, God's children, have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. They are taking Holy Communion, and they learn how to do it properly, but for whatever reason, they decided they're, instead of taking the Holy Communion the right way, they're going to choose to follow their appetites. They're going to follow their hunger for getting drunk on wine, which is flesh, fleshly behavior. And our Father says, look, you're following that fleshly behavior. You are going to become weak, and you are going to become sickly. And what were you telling me? If I'm going to church and, and, and I still can get weak and sickly if you're doing it for the wrong reasons. No, just like tithing. 
if you tithe for the wrong reason, what what good is your tithe? You know, if you're tithing, say, well, it's I'm I'm commanded to give a tenth, so that's why I'm giving it. I gotta give a little to get a little. I gotta give a little to get a little, and uh, I've run across people like that, and I've I've taught about that before. So, this is telling us why many people are sick and weak among us that are Christian. You know, because they're doing things. Let's put it in a big perspective. Because they're doing things away from God, not following God as he commanded us to do. And we start doing things on our own. How we want to do it, when we want to do it, the way we want to do it. Well, you can, but don't expect the blessings of God if you do. The only way you're going to get blessings from God is if you do things God's way. Why should he bless you if you're not doing things his way? 31. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. In other words, if we judge ourselves properly of, 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 of doing this or not doing this, we'll be judging properly. In other words, we'll learn. And, and if you were doing this, okay, stop it and do it the right way. 32. But when ye are judged, we are chastened of the Lord. In other words, the Lord will judge those he loves. And if you're one that is coming together for, for uh, Holy Communion to get drunk and to party it up and to have bread and wine, you are going to be corrected by God. That's his promise to you. But along that line, you've got to listen to that correction. You've got to realize, oops, I've screwed up here. Forgive me, Father. You know, and for whatever reason get that, that you've fallen away, a lot of times it's because of the people around you and the teachings around you, well, then get back in the Word of God and do things the right way. That's, our, that's what, with what I'm going through. We've talked about this numerous times through this whole trial. That, And it is a trial. There's lessons we are learning along the way of, of having these difficulties of health and such. That, just like Job, you know, do you curse God and die, or does it strengthen your faith? Well, Job never crossed Job's mind to curse God. No, and but die. his wife said that his to him. His wife said God, that yes. to him. You know, it, it's well, a, what's the whole point of getting chastened? In other words, what's the whole point of the Lord correcting us? It says that we should not be condemned with the world. Mm -hmm. That's the whole point. God does not want you to be condemned with the world. Well, it's all to be saved. With what the world is going to be condemned for what they are not doing according to this word, God's word. That's our instruction booklet. And if you don't want to follow it, guess what? You don't have to follow it. But if you don't follow it, don't expect the blessings from God. Now, granted, you are going to be corrected first. And again, I'm talking to the Christian. We all know what's going to happen to the heathen. They don't have a change of heart, change of mind, except Lord Jesus Christ. They're, they're doomed completely. They're going to be blotted out from existence. We're talking about those that have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. But for whatever reason, they have a tendency of going off in different avenues, different, different denominations, as the word says, dissension. God wanted us, one God, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism, one God and Father of all. We're all to be on the same page. We can bring in our own individuality up to a certain point, our expertise, if you will, but we do it to build each other up. And if we have a, a dissension, a disagreement, we follow what the Word says about that. We follow what God tells us to do, and then we're doing what's right. We can agree to disagree. However, we don't let allow that to turn into dissension against one another. And that's what's happening in the world. Separation, division, chaos. 33. I'm almost out of time. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry or wait one for another. In other words, don't go in there and, and drink up all the wine and eat up all the bread. And, and, and There's not enough for everybody else. You do it all together. That's why when we have Holy Communion, and, and the ones that do it correctly, I see this happening, you, you pass out the, 
the unleavened bread and you pass it all out, but not every, you don't eat it. As soon as you get it, you wait for everyone to have a piece and then we take it. Then we pray. Same with the, the wine. There's an order you know, to it. There's an order to it and there's, we do it together. And finally, verse 34. And if any man hunger, if you're, you, know, you can get hungry, you're in the flesh. Your flesh gets hungry. If any man hunger, let him eat at home. You're hungry? Hey, I got to go to Holy Communion today. We're having Holy Communion. I'm really hungry. Well, then eat something. You know, eat something before you have Holy Communion. That doesn't mean you have to fast before you have Holy Communion. You can eat, you can drink before Holy Communion, but you don't eat in excess and you don't get drunk. That you come not together unto condemnation. That's what will happen. You'll come if you don't do it the proper way under God's judgment. And the rest will I set in order when I come. In other words, remember, he had other things to say. But instead of throwing out everything, like throwing out the anchor, he's just going to put this one particular situation that he's writing to them on. And he says, when I get there, I'll tell you about the rest. You know, and we're going to end here today. Um, now, the importance of this, really, if you put it all in a nutshell, is order and discipline. Whether it be the man and woman and the covering over them, or, or having the Holy Communion, it's having godly order and discipline. And to do things, follow what God gives us in his word, how to do it, and then, once we learn how to do it, maintain that. Have order and discipline. Because the world wants to pick and choose. Believe it or not, churches want to pick and choose what they want to follow. Some churches today, if you don't go in and have your feet washed, they won't accept you. That's their way of, of saying, well, this is what Christ did, so everyone must do this. Well, if you're not baptized in their church, you can't go That's to another. Church. If you're not baptized in their church... You, you can't join their church unless you're baptized into... You're not baptized into a church. See, coming out the gate, that's wrong teaching. You're baptized. You're doing it for Jesus. As a matter of fact, we just had two baptisms mm -hmm. last Saturday, uh, which is a blessing to be a part of. Um, two, uh, two young people. Um, Jacob, how old is Jacob? Jacob's. Now he's a teenager. The other one's yet a teenager. Yeah, almost. But they both have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, and they walk in his ways. And they, they wanted to be baptized. And so we baptized them. But we did it in the name of the Father, Yahweh, the Son, Yeshua, and the Holy Spirit, the Ruach. And, and, that's, and, and it's to represent what Christ did. Baptism is not going to get you the kingdom of God. We do it because Christ did it. And what Christ said at one point is, follow me. Those two words mean a whole lot if you understand it. Follow me means you do what I say. You do what I do. And you let the world take care of itself. I'm your example. I'm your example. So, any questions? Let us pray. Holy Father, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity of this day. We thank you for the blessing that you have bestowed upon each and every one of us. Our cups truly do runneth over, Father, because of your teachings. Because of, of when we fail, and we all do at times, you are quick to correct us. Because you know we're in the flesh. We're going to make mistakes. But we rely on you and no other to correct us. Oh, there's plenty of people today that want to correct us. Everybody has an opinion, and we listen to those opinions, but your opinion is the one we put first and foremost, and we follow what you give us. I pray for everyone here today and their families and all those on YouTube and their families that we continuously follow in thy ways. And we love you with all our hearts, with all our minds, with all our strengths, and with all our souls. For it is in Yahshua's precious holy name we pray. Amen.
to God be the glory.